uh, we haven't seen you in the past six days. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm sure God has done something for you in those past six days that, that's worth bragging about. Any, any, just one person. Anybody? I, well, I have to say he's not my guest. I'm fired up. God's just so awesome. Yeah. His word is so true. And everything about it is going to come true that he says is going to come true. And you look around and you see things that go on. And you know, the Bible says that he's going to pour out a strong delusion in the last days. We better get ready, folks. Mm. You look at the strong delusion. I mean, you just look. I mean, men thinking they're women, dressing their own way. <laughs> you know, the, the things that are used to not, our grandparents would be appalled by what we see today. Oh, yeah. You know, and. and Climate control. Where does man get off thinking they control the climate? God controls that. <coughs> I mean, there, see the dilution, the diludedness mm -hmm. of the world that's that's going on around us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just you're going to do the delusion where you don't believe the truth, but their their truth is so mixed up <laughs> in the world today, mm -hmm. and you see it all around us. I mean, it's just one evident that the Bible teaches us that we're living in the last days. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming back. Amen. And I thank, thank God for that. Praise God. Amen. 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 I thank God too, just to piggyback off of you, that we have the word to keep us grounded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. like you said, they, they don't have a love for the truth, and that's the reason for them believing the, the delusion. You know what I mean? But 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 the reverse of it is those that have a love for the truth, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, we're walking in the light. We don't have any reason to stumble. No. You know what I mean? During these, these dark times. And, and I'll say something else. We're called to love them. Right. Amen. Show love to them, not hate. Amen. I mean, there's Amen. enough hate going around. <laughs> right? They get that from the world, but no. not from the body. But from the body of Christ, even though we're not believing the lie, we need to love the people. Oh, yeah. Amen. Because we're never going to get them over to the truth without the love. Absolutely. Amen. That'll bridge the gap. Absolutely. That'll bridge the gap. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's a good word, brother. It's a good word. Thank you for that. That's a congregation. You can take that as an encouragement. <laughs> Amen. That's something to take with us when we go out uh, into the world. Uh, we got to love them. We got to love them. And, and I'll even put it like this. We get to love them. Yes. Yeah. How about that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's where you get to practice your faith. You get to, the, the, the rubber meets the road right there. Loving our neighbor, loving our brother, loving our, our spouse, loving our enemy. Amen. Uh, uh, we can love our enemy. You, know, you can't, you can't cuss the hell out of somebody. You can't beat the hell out of somebody, but you probably can love the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I bet we have a quotation of the day. Mm -hmm. Yep, mm -hmm. Daniel Webster. Whatever makes me good Christians makes them good citizens. Wow. All right. Yes. Amen. 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 That's a byproduct of of what we're doing yeah. right now. Amen. Process. Thank you for that, Brother Marcel. Appreciate that. We're going to put that uh, uh, in our social media congregation. Let them have some of that to chew on. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I think we're ready for our assignment from heaven today. Are you ready? Yep. Ready to get into the Word? Well, let's do just that. Let's get into our Word. And uh, in particular, let's open up to Psalm 30, 133. Psalm 133. Bless you. Psalm 133. This is one of the shortest psalms in the book of Psalms. I should say in the Bible. It's only three verses. And when you find it, let's stand to our feet for the reading of the word. And I'm teaching from my, my usually I, I teach from the New King James Version. I might go south, Paul, on you one Sunday and catch off guard with a different translation but for now this particular Bible is easy to navigate through for me when I'm speaking publicly that's why I usually, usually use that one not necessarily for the translation but because of the, the tool itself that I have this particular <coughs> Bible Psalm 133 1 through 3 it reads as follows it says behold oh, let me read it. behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. 
It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your anointing to teach and preach with your clarity. Speak through me, Lord, your servant, and use me as your vessel to give us a word in due season. Father, I thank you for your word going out and prospering in the very thing you sent it to do. Lord, we give you praise for the results of it, the fruit that it brings in our lives and, and to your glory. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Those in agreement say amen. amen. All right. You may be seated. Uh, uh, dwelling together in unity is what we're looking at today. Dwelling together in unity. We moved from the call to unity, and now we're looking at the power of unity. Beginning with last week's message, this week is a follow-up on that concerning the power of unity. And specifically what we're going to be dealing with today is dwelling together in unity. Dwelling together in unity. And I want you to focus your spiritual spotlight on verse 1 of this passage. We read the whole thing. But where we're getting our message or the crux of our message from is actually verse 1. He says, Behold how good it and how pleasant it is for brethren. Everyone say brethren. brethren. For brethren to dwell together in unity. Brethren. Brethren. Uh, and I want to just kind of introduce this, this message this Sunday morning with a definition concerning that word brethren. Uh, because it paints a picture for us to look at. And uh, overall, when we finish for today, you know, you should have a, a, a clear picture of, of where we are from God's perspective. Uh, and of course, keeping in mind that God is never caught off guard by anything we do or wherever we are. Keep that in mind. That's one thing that makes him safe to talk to. You know, when we pray, when we pray the prayer of supplication, which is not necessarily a prayer of faith, but just venting to God, you can vent to God about anything because he knows us intimately, but, and, and, and I, I won't say but, <coughs> and knowing us intimately, what we know in the family of God is that God is love. Remember that? God is love. The kind of love that he is, the Greek word is agape. That's covenant love. That's what we mean when we say unconditional love. That's covenant love. That God loves us with. And he doesn't have it. He is that kind of love. You see that? He is covenant love. And when we know God, we exhibit that. See, that God that we read about in the New Testament, the God of love, or God who is love himself, lives in us. And not only does he live in us, but when we learn about our salvation, how to utilize, how to benefit from our salvation, we actually learn how to let God, who is love, live through us. You see that? Remember, that, that falls in line with our twofold purpose uh, in life. We are to be, number one, containers of God, and then, number two, expressors of it. You see? So, therefore, what Marty was saying, we have to love them, or, or like I say, a better way of putting it, we get to love them. What we get to do is we, we get to turn God loose on them. You see that? If you're turning God loose on somebody, you're not raining down wrath on them. You're raining down love on them. You see? For God, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, he's been shed abroad in our hearts. Or I should say this, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so he is the one who empowers us. To love the unlovable. You see? And whenever we love the unlovable, and that's a faith choice, we never look more like Jesus. You see? Yeah. So uh, uh, the body of Christ is not here to show the hand of God, but to, rather to show the heart of God. And Jesus would be the heart of God in action. We see him in action. Uh, and he models the love of God, something that we can't imitate, by the way. We can't imitate it because it has to be reproduced in us. It's supernatural. See, it's not natural to love somebody the way he tells us or teaches us or exemplifies for us to love 
in the, in the New Testament. Uh, so it takes being in relationship with the Holy Spirit. He's the one that empowers us <coughs> to love properly, to love like we're supposed to. But in this verse, he says, uh, uh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Brethren, the uh, Hebrew word for brethren is ach. Ach is pronounced A-H-C-H, ach. In the Strong's Concordance, if you have one, uh, uh, it would be number, definition number 251 in the Old Testament. Uh, it means brother, especially, or it translates brother, and it's especially an immediate relative. But it's not just an immediate relative, it's also uh, any fellow man or fellow man or countryman or companion. That's what a brethren would be or brother would be, a fellow countryman or companion. Ach, this is a little factoid I, I'll leave you with. Uh, 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 ach, that word for brother in the Hebrew, it occurs more than 740 times in the Old Testament. Now, where do we see its first appearance? Glad you asked. Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. Uh, 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 this is the narrowest usage of ach, and it refers to sons of the same parents. This word ach. This is where Cain slew his brother or killed his brother Abel, and God asked him, giving him a chance to repent. He says, where is your brother or ach? Abel, where is Abel at? Where is your brother Abel? He says, you know, I don't know. You can get smart with God. Am I my Ach, Ach's uh, 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 keeper? Am I my Ach's keeper? Uh, the answer to that is emphatically yes. We are our brother's keeper. Okay? I'll bear that out in a minute. Uh, but Isaiah 41, verses 6 and 7. You don't have to turn there, but Isaiah 41, verses 6 and 7. You can reference that later on. Uh, 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 this is uh, uh, this shows us the wider usage of ach, uh, and it's speaking of the neighbors or fellow workers of craftsmen. You could say your co-workers. They would be your ach, your brothers and sisters. When you go to work, how many of you have? I mean, you know, you're long term. Who, who, who's got long term job right now? You've been on a job for a long time. Uh, same job. How long? How long have you been on your job? I just want to hear some numbers. Just uh, seven years. 47 years? 37. 37? Wow. Anybody beat Earl? 37 years? <laughs> Not quite. What are some of the other numbers you got? Ten and a half. Ten and a half in yours? Wow, that's a long time too. Anybody else just throwing it out? I Marcel threw his hand at me. 20. 20. Wow. That's a long time. It's funny how you're, you're on, on, you know, on the job for so long. You know, I've been cutting hair professionally now for 26 you know, uh, it's been a long time. It doesn't feel like it. You know, I kind of enjoy, you know, cutting hair. It gets fun after a while, especially when you buy some new blades. You know what I mean? New, new blades. I mean, you don't see, you don't get it. Y'all are laughing at me. You don't get it. But it's okay. You can laugh. But I, I, when I, when I, when I bless you, when I'm cutting hair, you know, I, it's fun to me. But it sometimes becomes unfun. I don't recognize it when it hit. When it when it happens, I just kind of go into a season of it not being fun anymore. You know, and, uh, 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 and I noticed that, that I'm working harder for some reason. I can't figure out why until my customer starts saying, ouch. I'm like, well, this is hurting? You know, yeah, it's pulling, man. I'm like, oh, I need new blades. You know what I mean? Then when I go buy some new blades or I have some new blades delivered and have them, you know, I install them and things like that. Well, I'm, I'm not a good mechanic, but I'll probably build you a pair of clippers. I can do that. You know, I, so I put the blades on the clippers and things like that. Now I'm cutting hair. It's fun again. You know what I mean? It, it's fun because I, now it's easy. It's easy to do. But anyway, uh, regardless of that, who I work with, who you work with, that's your work family. You see, that those are your brothers and sisters that you work with, that you're around. Sometimes, I mean, I, I, I imagine, I mean, see, I have a job where I don't have a boss. I am my boss. I'm my, my own boss. And, and of course, well, I say this, to the world, I'm my own boss. You know, I work for Jesus, right? But they don't know it. They're not aware of that. You know, but some of you might have a boss you have to work for. Some of you might work for a corporation and you can't talk about Jesus. You know, I understand that, you know. And I'm sure the Lord gives you your ways of how you can minister to your brothers, your work brothers or your work sisters at times, right? 
you know, uh, as Christians, you know, somehow we find a way, even though we, you know, they, they tell us what to do. It's better what the scripture says to obey God than man. But, you know, I mean, also use wisdom because you got to pay your bills. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's good to walk by faith, but don't be presumptuous and be like, well, I'm going to do what God said. I'm going to share my, my gospel with him. And then you get fired. <laughs> you know what I mean? You get fired. Well, that's not what God intended. For, for, for to happen for you. He blessed you with the job. You lost it by your own foolishness. Thinking that by faith, you know what I mean, you're going to do what you got to do and be persecuted. See, you persecuted for unrighteousness right there. The company told you not to do it, and you did it anyway. We see, you got to let the Lord lead you uh, whenever you're, you're witnessing, you know what I mean? Uh, and that requires wisdom. See, Proverbs says, uh, uh, you know, uh, how does it put it? You know, a wise person wins souls. You see that? A wise person wins souls. Well, it takes wisdom to win a soul. You see? When you're, when you're, when you're uh, uh, winning a soul over, you're doing just that. You're winning them and you're using wisdom to do it. You see? And you can keep your job and bring them into the kingdom. Even by doing it. You have to be overt, be, you know, be covert. Go under the radar if you can't be over the radar. I, I can be both. In my job, I can do it do either way. I prefer covert because I want people to be themselves, you know, because that's where you can really minister to them. You find them in their pain, and now you can give them the salve of the Word of God, and it doesn't sound religious to them anymore. Now it's something like life. It's life to them and health to their flesh, you see. You can witness to them like that. I was talking to somebody, I'm sure, on that. But, uh, Isaiah 41, verses 6 and 7, uh, if you read that, I don't want you to get confused. You don't have to turn there, but I do want to share this with you. you know, they got, the, the, uh, the nations uh, got wind that Israel is coming to do war with them, to do battle with them, actually to, to bring judgment, God's judgment on them for their idolatry. And here's what they do when you read verses 6 and 7. They pull their brethren together uh, to make their idols to set up. So that they can go out into war against Israel. And that's why they're going to lose. All right. However, you see something taking place. Uh, uh, they look at each other as brethren. And they're pulling together to fight against Israel. You see? It's bad to fight against Israel, God's chosen in this scene right here. But, but uh, uh, what you do see is they're pulling together. You see that? Here's a, an example down home that you can see this through better. Uh, and by the way, I only have one PowerPoint for you today, so yeah, I was listening for a sigh of relief. <laughs> there, okay, I saw it back there. Five, okay, confirmation. One PowerPoint towards the end, and we're, we're almost there. But, but I, I want you to realize something. Uh, uh, when you're talking about your neighbors or, or your brethren, your co-workers, see, with my co-workers, uh, uh, we all are in unity or in unison on our prices and our service to our clients. Sometimes our clients uh, 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 can't get in with us, so they go to one of the brethren in the shop. And it's no problem because they're keeping it in the family, all right? So we don't, we don't have a problem with that we, just as long as they get taken care of. Because remember who we are, servants. And we're servants. Now, we have clientele. We have our own clientele. And sometimes we can't take my client take care of. So one of my brothers in the, in the shop will take care of them. And they'll come back to me. But you know, it's important that they get taken care of, even if, if, if I send them to the, my brother. You know what I mean? Then that's an appreciation for me. They do the same for me. And if somebody comes in the shop and they want to act a fool, we all are in unison against whoever it is. You know what I mean? To whatever degree that that might mean within the law. <laughs> all right? Keep that in mind. But we all act together in unison. Your, your co-workers, your, your brethren. Same thing with your neighbors. We have a, a neighbor next door. Uh, Sam, that's my brother right there. Uh, love him dearly. Sam and Meg, whenever we've gone out of town, they take care of our cat Jazzy for us. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Don't have to worry about it. Trust him with going inside of our house. You know what I mean? Good to have people around like that. Art and Sandra across the street. You know what I mean? If somebody comes down the neighborhood because we get <coughs> down our block, we stay on a dead end, dead end street. So we don't have any flow of traffic going through. So if we see somebody walking down our street that we don't know, everybody's out looking, you know what I mean, to some degree. Especially Art and Sandra, they got cameras everywhere, you know what I mean? But we're watching and looking out for each other. 
You see, just like at work, at home, in our neighborhood, uh, our brethren. All right. Uh, which brings us to our topic now. I know I've been going around the block on you, but this isn't a long message. Uh, dwelling together in unity. This is our topic that we're dealing with. Now, why is that so important? Well, in the sight and perspective of God, it's a wonderful thing for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity from the perspective of God. How many of you are interested in seeing it from God's perspective? Amen. It does something to you and for you when you see it from God's perspective. Uh, uh, now, uh, priorities is really key in this message, in today's message. Everybody say priorities. Priorities. Yeah. priorities. See, we all have priorities. We have to prioritize certain things in our lives. Uh, uh, just as it's true for families, when you're talking about dwelling together in unity, it's true for families. It's even more so for spiritual relationships. All right? Now, what do I mean by that? I'm glad you asked that one, too. Look at Matthew chapter 12, and this will show us what our priorities are. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I want you to look at verse 46. This is where the standard has been raised for family. All right? When you get there, say, I got it. All right, it says, while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Now, that's his family right there, his immediate family, his mother and his brothers, they were his, his actual uh, flesh and blood mother and brothers. They were outside. They wanted to speak with him. You see that. This is Jesus that we're reading about. Then one said to him, said to Jesus, he said, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. So that confirms what their intentions were. But, everybody say but. <coughs> but, it says, he answered and he said to, to, uh, to the one who told him, uh, uh, he answered to him, he says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Who is my mother and who are my brothers? He stretched out his hand toward his disciples. Pointing at his disciples, I'm pointing at you all. You all are disciples. And he said, here are my mother and my brothers. You see that? His spiritual family. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Isn't that why we're here? We're here to hear the will of his father so that we can do it and fulfill what he just said about his <coughs> disciples, which would be us too. These are my mother and these are my brothers. They that do the will of my father. He prioritized them above <coughs> his own flesh and blood, mother and brothers. I'm sure that was probably a shock to Mary, because he remember at that time, Mary and his brothers, uh, uh, at that time, they were spiritually dead. <laughs> you see, that's why Jesus would always have to say, like, how long do I have to be with you and keep telling you these things? It was because they were spiritually dead. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in them yet. Jesus was not yet glorified because he hadn't died yet. Therefore, he was the only body of Christ on earth. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I'll let that sink in for a minute. He was the only body of Christ on earth, and everybody else was outside of the body of Christ. And it was interesting, he fellowshiped with people outside the body of Christ. The only people he had a problem with, which remember, he's reflecting who God is, he's showing us the Father. The only people that Jesus, or put like this, that God has a problem with, and we see it through Jesus, are religious people. You see that? People who are more interested in showing the hand of God and they're incapable of showing the heart of God. You see? You can't show the heart of God without his empowerment. You see? Remember, the heart of God is love and we can't imitate that. It has to be reproduced. You do recall Jesus saying, unless a single kernel of wheat 
falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. He's talking about a kernel of wheat. That's true in the natural, but it's also true in the spiritual. This is why he said it. See, the life of any kernel or any seed for it to be reproduced, it has to die first in the ground. See, once it goes to the ground and dies, the life of that seed is now released into the crop. You see? So, the wheat field, that's the church, that's the body of Christ. That would be us. We're the wheat field. We're the wheat. The world are the tares. We're the wheat. Do you get it? We're the wheat. But where do we get our life from? It's from the original kernel of wheat. He fell to the ground. He died. His life was released into us. The crop. The wheat. That would make us the body of Christ. You getting that? So Jesus prioritizes his spiritual family over his physical or natural family. Very interesting. Then in John chapter 17, he prays for all of us that we will be one just like he and his father are one. You see? Yeah. Now, you do believe that Jesus gets all of his prayers answered, right? He does. And he did. We see that answer in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, by the way. Acts chapter 1 Acts chapter 2. Uh, but first, I want to call your attention to something. See, remember this. Remember, who is this Jesus that we know, that we see in the gospel, who is he? Who is this Jesus? I'm glad you asked that question because he's uh, the head of a new race. That's who he is. He's the head of a new race. He came to model this new race person. He modeled what it is to be a kingdom citizen. He's the number one or chief citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You see that? Mm -hmm. He is the, the uh, model son of God, model child of God. And we're to live just like him. But remember, we can't imitate. We can't, we can't imitate that life. It has to be reproduced in us. You see? Have you ever asked yourself this question, why is Jesus alive today? You know what I mean? I, 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 sometimes I do that. I sit down and ask some silly questions like, what is the definition of God? I mean, you know, something like that. I don't know if you ever do that. But if you ask yourself, why is Jesus alive today? Here's the, the, the biblical answer. He's alive today so that he can continue to live his life in and through us. You see that? So we're not trying to imitate him as much as we are allowing him to live his life in and through us. And it's as we get to know him through the word that we begin to reflect him to the world. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so we become like the God we behold. And as we behold him through the word, we get to know him and see him for who he is. And we appreciate that to the extent where we reflect it. So we don't have to produce it. We just reflect it. See, he calls us, he calls us the branch and we're, he's the vine. All right. He's the true vine and we're the branch part. Our job is not to produce grapes, but to bear them. Subtle difference, but it's so profound. See, the religious person is trying to produce a grape, and you can't, a branch can't produce it. Uh, uh, how does a branch produce a grape? Well, what it does is it doesn't produce grapes. It just abides in the vine, you see? So that's what our job is as branches is not produce grapes, but abide in the vine. The byproduct is we'll bear grapes, you see? And that's our job. We bear the fruit, but we do it by abiding in the vine. That word abide means to make ourselves at home in. We make ourselves at home in Jesus, who is the word. What ends up happening is we start bearing fruit. We start reflecting God to the world. How many of you like fruit, by the way? You like fruit? I think I'm going to go to Walmart and get some grapes later on today just because of my own message. <laughs> I'm just sharing my thoughts with you, thinking out loud. But, but uh, uh, grapes are, are, are pleasant to eat, especially when they're sweet. You know, uh, uh, when they're sweet, you really appreciate those, those things. They're refreshing to you, and they're, they're good for you. De detoxants, is that what they do? They detoxify you? Uh, they have those kind of properties. 
you know, uh, uh, when, just like that, see, fruit, God wants us to bear fruit because he wants us to be delicious to the world. <laughs> you see that? That's why it says in the Old Testament, he says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see? We live a life being plugged into the vine where, where the result is we taste good. People want some of that. You know what I mean? We can show them where to get it. It's in the true vine. This is where we live. And it's good for brethren to dwell together in unity. You see that? Jesus prayed for that. Now I said, who is Jesus? It's Jesus. He's the head of a new race. A new race of individuals. See, we're not Jew, we're not Gentile anymore. We're the church, the body of Christ. You see, he makes the two one in Christ. Uh, and there's three entities in the world. See, it tells us too in the New Testament that we're not to be an offense, not to Jew, not to the Gentile, and not to the church. You see, so those are the three entities in the world. When the rapture takes place, it'll be back to just being Jew and Gentile for a while. You see, the church will be in heaven. But for now, the church is on the earth, and we're not to be an offense to anybody. If you're offensive, you don't look like a child of God. I'm not saying that you're not. You just don't look like a child of God if you are offensive. You see that? Whenever you offend somebody and you don't care, you don't look like a child of God. You see? Be aware of that, or beware of it. Be aware and beware. <laughs> you see that? Because uh, it marks you as not being a child of God. Repent if that's where you are. If that's where you've been and haven't said I'm sorry for any kind of offense you might have done. You violated the scripture and you violated love. You see that? Uh, uh, therefore, you want to keep exemplifying love. Uh, that's what Jesus is looking back when he, or looking for when he comes back. Will he find faith in the earth? Well, remember, faith works by love. So, you want to make sure you're operating in love. That's what makes your faith work. You'll need that when you come across some kind of spiritual battle in life, some kind of hardship. You want to make sure that your heart stays tender towards God. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, make note of this. Now, Jesus, I said, is the head of a new race. The book of Acts. What the book of Acts uh, uh, is the church in its infant stage. All right. This is the church, the body of Christ. Actually, the church is... The answer to his prayer for oneness. When Jesus prayed for our oneness, we see the fulfillment of that prayer in Acts, in the book of Acts. And I want to take you there for a minute. The other ones we didn't have to look at. But I do want you to uh, uh, see what, what, what happens in the book of Acts. Uh, uh, by the way, what this book does for us, the book of Acts, uh, is it documents... Uh, it documents... How the wonderful spiritual relationship between brothers and sisters in Christ, how it came into being after that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which was at Pentecost. All right. Look at Acts chapter one. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> Acts chapter one, verses four through eight. Then I want you to hold your place there. Don't lose it. And go to Acts chapter two. Verses 1 through 4. All right? Just a page over. Back to Acts chapter 1. This is the Holy Spirit promised by Jesus, okay? The Holy Spirit is promised by Jesus. It says, and being assembled together with them, Jesus, he commanded them not to depart from Jer Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they came together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put uh, in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. All right. He's telling the results of the Holy Spirit when he comes what they're going to be doing. They're going to be a witness. Now, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say that they will do witnessing. He said that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be a witness. See, those lights up here, the lights that Brother Marty set up for us up here, uh, 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 they're not doing witnessing. 
or, or doing or, or any kind of witnessing whatsoever. What they are are being a witness to life or being a witness to electricity. I'll put it like that. All right. Uh, they are by their union together. Uh, these lights are bearing witness or being a witness to electricity. They're not doing a witness. So we're not going out doing witnessing as much as we are being a witness when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. You see? His life just ignites us to where we become a witness. We don't have to go out and do witnessing. That's what I'm trying to say. In that sense, this is the supernatural aspect of it. And it's where it comes into being or where the church comes into, into being. Now that's the promise. Jesus said this is the result of that promise. Now I want you to flip over and see the fulfillment of that promise. Verses 1 through 4, chapter 2. And I want you to notice something in here. In verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, it says, they were all with one accord in one place. Huh. Then something began to happen. It says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What are we looking at right here? We're looking at a supernatural wonder that took place as a result of their being gathered together in one accord or on one accord. You see that? And it happened on a feast day, Pentecost, which would be the Feast of Weeks. Uh, ten days after Jesus uh, 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 ascended to heaven. It was ten days later. Pentecost came. On that day, here comes the Holy Spirit and filled all the disciples. There were 120 of them uh, that day, that morning. Uh, we know it was morning because they thought you know, all the gathering Jews from everywhere in the world came to Jerusalem at that time. And they heard these disciples from Jerusalem speaking their native language. All right. Now, we can't limit uh, uh, God to just speaking the languages of men because Paul also told us, though I speak with the tongues of both men and angels. So that would make it a heavenly language as well in some instances. But here it's the language of all the, the uh, Jews from all over the world. God is speaking to the world now and it's coming out in the form of praise through these people. And it brought new converts in. It got their attention. You see that? What you're witnessing is the birth of the church. This is the church in its infant stage. And what that tells us is what God intends for us. What brings us together. When we come together, God can do supernatural things among us. And in this case, he births the church. He, he birthed the church uh, uh, on the day of Pentecost and here we are we've come into being by the power of the Holy Spirit and not to do witnessing but to be witnesses of Jesus does that make sense yeah. to be witnesses that's who we are so it documents how this wonderful spiritual relationship between brothers and sisters in Christ came into being after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so here's your one and only PowerPoint you ready True spiritual unity flows from the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of God's people. True spiritual unity, it flows from the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of God's people. Remember I told you before, one of the one of the uh, I could say that, let me just say this. One of the things that the Holy Spirit empowers us to do uh, without getting weird, I don't want you to be afraid. Like, I don't want to go out and do something crazy that will draw attention to myself. We see, whatever God does, when we yield to Him, there's purpose involved. All right? He doesn't do anything to be weird. All right? It might be weird to you because you don't understand what's going on, but don't count it out because God, in His wisdom, remember, His, his foolishness is wiser than the wisest man. 
There is no foolishness in God. You know what I mean? So he has a purpose for whatever he leads you to do. But here's what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. He empowers us to be a genuine friend to somebody. You see that? I don't have to go to prayer service with somebody, you know, to show them that I love God. I can go fishing with them. <laughs> See me? And sit down and we can fish and talk about fish and then I can slip some God in or I don't have to slip him in. You know, he'll just come up. If he's in you, he's going to come out. <laughs> right? See, our salvation is personal, but it ain't private. You know, we're supposed to be sharing. So I'll conclude with this. See, from God's perspective, it's not only good for us when we dwell together in unity, but it's also pleasant to him for his children to dwell together in deep spiritual unity. When we fellowship with the Holy Spirit, like we say in our benediction, you know, uh, uh, that takes us into a level of, of, of intimacy with the Father that can't be reproduced. I put it like this, it can't be imitated. It has to be reproduced. And because we've come into a relationship with the Holy Spirit, that makes it possible for us to not just fellowship with God, the Father, and Jesus, the Son, uh, but it empowers us to fellowship with one another in unity. It empowers us to unify uh, and become one. Uh, and it's good when we learn to dwell or live in that realm. Amen. It's nothing impossible for God. And in that kind of atmosphere, there's nothing impossible for God to perform in our midst. Amen. Yeah. For the benefit of a lost and dying world. Uh, we're empowered to be genuine with them, to be true, and to uh, be guided into all truth. We also have the empowerment to love the unlovable. When the time comes, he shows us what we need to do or, or how he wants to manifest. Our job, yield to him. That's our job. Amen. 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 Let's all stand together. And I want to give you an opportunity to receive Christ. Uh, if you haven't, uh, uh, he wants to bring you into his family. He wants to be your elder brother. And he wants to share his father with you. Amen. Amen. And there's some here who haven't received the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? He's the one that makes the gospel real to us. But he also is the one who brings all the benefits of the cross into our now. You know, you need healing for your body. You know I mean, uh, he's the one that brings that to, to the now, uh, where our faith lays hold of it. Amen. Uh, he empowers us to receive what we need from him. But he also empowers us to be uh, the effective witness that we need to be. Uh, but he's the one that's going to help you grow in godliness. I want to invite you to receive him. So there's an invitation for those to receive Jesus. There's an invitation for those to receive of the Holy Spirit, whatever the need might be. And then there are some who might have a need for a church home. Uh, First Free Will Baptist would love to be that church for you. And if you're still shopping, make sure that you find a church that loves the Lord, Christ-centered, biblically sound. Uh, and that's where you can grow in godliness. And this will always be a, a home away from home for you uh, if you don't make this one your home. But I want to pray for those also <laughs> who uh, uh, would like to make this this church, their home. Anyone who fits any of those invitations or if you need hands laid on you for some sickness or disease, uh, uh, come forward. We'll, we'll, we'll do just that. Lay hands on you and let the Lord do his thing uh, in healing your body. If you have any of those needs uh, that I've mentioned, feel free to come forward as I pray. You can come forward up, uh, up here. I'm going to pray for you and then I'm going to come and lay hands on you. Uh, and we'll let the Lord do what he does. You know, those of you who have to leave, we understand uh, you take off and do what you got to do. But we also have a run through for our play. I want to make sure that you know that. Uh, uh, and Brother Kirk has made uh, some flyers that he was going to put up back there on the board uh, for us, for, for Kyle Dillingham when he comes. Uh, uh, that way we can put it on our social media and make sure people know uh, that we have something for them to come to. Uh, on that date, you'll find that back there. Uh, so keep that in, 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 in mind as well, okay? So I'm going to pray for you and feel free right now. If you want to come forward, feel, feel free to do so. If you just want to come forward and pray, the altar is available for just that. And, and, and I don't have to do anything. You Just between you and the Lord, if you want to come and do that as well. So let's bow together. Uh, hey, it's Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the word 
that we've received. Thank you for your revealing your desire for us, Father, to dwell in unity. Father, we want to be pleasing to you. Uh, Lord, we, we want to let you live through us. And we allow that today, Father. We lay aside everything that slows us up, uh, everything that trips us up, Father. We put that to the side right now. And we let you live through us. I pray that you would fill us brand new with your spirit. Uh, uh, that we would be expressions of you in our workplace and on our block, wherever we are. Father, let them see you in us. And glory. when they see that, they glorify you. And heaven, we want to. That's what we want. We desire that, Father. Plant this word deep in our heart. That we would be doers of it, not hearers only. Give us that grace to walk it out. Uh, Father, we know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And we thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for it. Uh, those we've prayed for, Father, I thank you for hearing those prayers. Those who have sickness in their bodies, Father, we speak healing to them. We drive that sickness out in the name of Jesus. Those who have cancers, we speak to those cancers right now. Command them to shrink to nothing. And we give you praise for healthy bodies, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we pray. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet friendship of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us now and forever. Let us all say it together. Amen. 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 Amen.